Thank you all for coming out. We expected there to be a lot of folks still on vacation tonight, and uh, you, you filled the house. And I'm particularly pleased that you did come out tonight because we have a very special announcement to make tonight. And it's, this looks like a blank slate, but it's not. <laughs> on the back side, we have the announcement of the new name of the Center for Desert Archaeology. We are now Archaeology Southwest. And we have spent literally the last six months trying to reassess where we're going, what we're doing. Uh, we're beginning our 30th year in 2012, and we realized that our name, the Center for Desert Archaeology, was not really covering everything that we do in terms of the geographic breadth. We don't just work in the desert. We needed a new, fresh image as we started this 40, uh, our 30th, uh, or third, we're starting our fourth decade, thank you. Uh, and we really feel that buying uh, into the name that we've used for the past, since 19, or two, Oh boy, since when? <laughs> since 1999, uh, for our Archaeology Southwest magazine has reached out to people. It's not going to be unfamiliar to adapt to, but it's going to give us a fresh new look to all of you and uh, the rest of the world. So we're not changing our mission. We're going to be doing this, a lot of the same things uh, with the same people and doing it, I think, with more energy and a, a really refreshed uh, view on the world. So, welcome to Archaeology Southwest. Mm -hmm. And that fits w very well into tonight's topic, which is preservation archaeology. Bernard Sequeiros, one of our, our uh, center board members, our Archaeology Southwest <laughs> board members. <laughs> All right, somebody start keeping track of how many times <laughs> that happens tonight. Um, old habits are very hard to break. Uh, Bernard Sequeiros is uh, a, a board member, and he and I will be sharing the discussion of uh, preservation archaeology. And as part of this presentation, we'll actually introduce ourselves, uh, so I won't go into much more detail about either of us. Um, but that question, what is preservation archaeology? I happened to be listening to NPR a little while ago, and there was a uh, coverage of one of the Ig Nobel uh, Prize, uh, and they introduced a concept that I thought was absolutely wonderful. It was the 24-7 lecture series. Now, those prizes are for scientific uh, research that either sounds so bizarrely uh, ped pedantic, mundane, uh, or just bizarre um, when you read about it. And so, but the 24-7 lecture series gives the scientist 24 seconds to explain the research, and then the seven is seven words to <laughs> dispense with the, all of the jargon and so on. and get to the essence of what they are doing. Well, we tried to cut the jargon out of the 24 second piece as well. So, but I will read it because I've only got 24 seconds. <laughs> so, for three decades, Archaeology Southwest has practiced a conservation-based approach to what we call preservation archaeology by conducting low impact investigations of big pic picture questions sharing our findings with the public and developing powerful site protection strategies, we create meaningful connections to the past and respectfully protect its increasingly endangered resources. That's the long definition of preservation archeology. span Now we'll shift to the short one. We explore and protect places that matter. Mm -hmm. So, we started using preservation archaeology at um, Archaeology Southwest in the year 2000. We, we 
actually gave titles to our, um, our uh, researchers and our, and our employees of research or preservation archaeologist. And we started saying that we're doing preservation archaeology. But it's preservation archaeology isn't just something that we do at Archaeology Southwest. It's really got quite a long history in this nation. And it's not just a private or a public sector or a private or public land uh, set of issues that get addressed with, through preservation archaeology. It's a, it's a blend. Uh, some of the highlights um, that tie us into a, a long historical continuum related to preservation 1892, uh, President Benjamin Harrison set aside the Casa Grande, 480 acres up near Coolidge, Arizona, as the first federal archaeological preserve in this nation. So that was one of the, I think, key historical events. The passage of the 1906 Antiquities Act, which started to actually protect uh, it required permits, it, it uh, levied fines on people who illegally uh, excavated on, on federal lands, and it also introduced the concept of national monuments. And so many of the special places here around the Southwest, the Grand Canyon was first proclaimed as a national monument through the Antiquities Act. Later it was expanded into a park. So some of these really important sort of federal level historical uh, legislation are the roots and, and uh, heritage of preservation archaeology. And one of the next big pieces was the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Urban renewal wiped out the cores of a lot of the, the, the cities across the nation. And that act was in part a response to uh, people's realization that they had lost some really special places in that process of somewhat unthinkingly uh, tearing apart their, their cities. And for me, and I think a lot of, of archaeologists, another really important milestone was the 1974 article written by archaeologist William Leip, who at that time was up at the Museum of Northern Arizona. And he wrote an art article called The Conservation Model for American Archaeology. And I think the key kernel in that is that archaeological resources are, are uh, non-renewable resources. If we lose one of these uh, 13th, 14th century uh, archaeological sites, you can't go out and restore that land and, and have the site that come back. So that is a really other critical um, piece of the background for preservation archaeology. So, I see preservation archaeology not as a simple uh, definition of that. I see it much more as a process, that the Archaeology Southwest is taking an active role in trying to promote preservation archaeology. We try to do it on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's many other folks out there who are also doing aspects of, of this. Uh, we may be some of the most devoted folks to preservation archaeology. Um, Aldo Leopold who <clears throat> wrote the Sand Country Almanac, County Almanac, and uh, spent his co career developing a concept of a land ethic and promoting wilderness, has, I think, a, a statement about how he views that ethic uh, that it may well apply to uh, preservation archaeology. He said, nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. It evolves in the minds of a thinking community. And I think that's really what we want preservation archaeology to be, something that does evolve over time. And what we're going to try to do tonight is to, Bernard and I will share some of our uh, personal uh, background and, and stories about uh, how we got to be sitting next to each other up here. <laughs> and also uh, try to share some of the ways in which communities can become uh, linked to, to the past, uh, to past places, and how, in our experiences, uh, we have seen that, that process work. So I'll just jump briefly into a, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I came to, 
Tucson in 1972. I came from Michigan, so I had no background in, in a desert environment other than the fact that I had been working in central Mexico in the Tehuacan Valley prior to uh, coming to, to Tucson. And the vegetation, the climate in that valley actually was very, very similar to what I experienced here when I got to Tucson. So I felt like I was uh, sort of coming home in a, in a way to where I had just left. And the, as I, the reason I came to Tucson was to attend graduate school and I almost immediately got opportunities to uh, conduct research with a um, woman on the Tana Autumn Reservation who was harvesting saguaro, uh, harvesting uh, the choya buds in the spring, uh, processing uh, mesquite pods to, to create flower, and walking around the desert in the summer while she was harvesting the saguaro uh, fruit, watching that daily cycle of, of, uh, that she went through early in the morning to harvest uh, cooking the, um, the fruit down into a, a syrup in the, as she got back and making baskets under a ramada. Uh, a real feel for what uh, life in this desert was in a, in a deeper time sense than I was ever, had ever experienced before. So um, the very first project that 30 years ago we did was a contract to do work out on the Tana Autumn Reservation at, in the little community of Nolik. It's a little bit west and a little bit north of, of Sells. And that involved, prior to a road going through, excavating in two historic households right at the turn of the century. So working with uh, a, an, a man who became an elder, uh, Danny Lopez, who had done the uh, interviews of, of the community members there. And he was actually able to identify the person who lived in the, the uh, archaeological uh, place that we were excavating. And working within that, living within that community was, again, another sort of connection to both the historical literature, the archaeological re uh, remains of that, that time period. So another opportunity to uh, experience something that it was very different from what I had known before coming to Tucson. And finally, the very first project in the Tucson Basin that back in those early days uh, we got involved in was at a ball court uh, community, and we'll talk about there's a ball court behind me. Um, we'll talk about um, a ball court um, and ball courts a little bit more uh, later on, but the, the so-called Valencia site, Valencia Road where it intersects the Santa Cruz, um, north of that is a Hohokam ball court community. And in 1981, the city of Tucson was putting a road through that and they had actually done all of, almost all of the work. They were ready to pave when a group from San Javier said, look at all the black soil that you're plowing through out there. This is a major archaeological site. Stop this work. And so there we came in at, on that project as after a loss of a portion of this large archaeological site, and I think that's another theme that I'd like to echo here a couple of times, that oftentimes a loss can actually stimulate a positive outcome. After that, um, the Tucson Pima County Historical Commission pushed both the city and, counts and the county into recognizing the need to address the prehistory and the prehistoric archaeological sites prior to construction projects. So, it really turned the, our two um, major uh, municipal governments here around and caused a lot of archaeology to happen after that. So there is at least a, um, some good outcomes that can come af after 
an unfortunate thing. But I think with preservation archaeology, what we're trying to do is to get out ahead of those kinds of, of um, outcomes and address preservation and protection uh, before <coughs> those, those impacts happen. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Bernard and let him kind of bring his life into this equation. Okay. Uh, before I, I introduce myself, there are a couple of people in the audience that I'd like to recognize. First of all, a gentleman just walked in, Michael. Michael. Michael Reinsmith is uh, he's trying to walk away from me. Is the uh, uh, museum administrator out at where I work? I work for the Tahunatam Nations Cultural Center and Museum, and Michael just celebrated his first year with us, so uh, he's doing well out there. Then also, I'd like to introduce Jose Enriquez. Jose is uh, one of the elders that was involved with us on the uh, ethno history project along the San Pedro River Valley. And then uh, another gentleman, another elder, <laughs> Tony Chana. Tony is, uh, is a good friend from, from many, many years ago. He and I sit on the board, the board of trustees for the Thon Altman Community College. But Tony also is a retired uh, junior college or Pima Community College instructor and counselor, his wife Anna, uh, but Tony is also working with us on another project where we're working with uh, Dale Brenneman and the, at the State Museum on our, uh, reading and reviewing and discussing uh, some of the Spanish documents that were left by Father Kino and the, and the Spanish uh, soldiers that were in, you know, on our lands uh, back in the 1600s and early 1700s. And so uh, I wanted to recognize them. Um, yes, please thank you. But uh, I'm, I'm a product of the reservation. <laughs> I grew up there. I was born uh, here in San Javier when it was a hospital many years ago. They consider it very sacred land now. No, <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I originated. <laughs> I grew up in cells, uh, attended the uh, the elementary school there uh, until I was ready to enter high school. Uh, our nation at that time did not have a high school on our lands. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we were at that age, we were all, and we all really looked forward <coughs> to leaving home to go off to uh, schools off of the nation in California, in Nevada, in Phoenix, in Oklahoma, or wherever. And so uh, I, I spent uh, my high school years up at a school in Phoenix. It's no longer there, Phoenix Indian High School, uh, where all of my, my grandparents and my uncles and everyone else had gone to school. I finished there, came back, to, uh, came back and worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, in a boarding school that, uh, that had just been completed on the nation, uh, a new boarding school. And um, I was hired on because uh, just the year prior to that, after I finished high school, I went back, actually went back to work at Phoenix Indian School for a year working uh, with the freshman boys in the dormitory, taking care of them in the dorm. And so because I had that experience working in the dorm, they asked me to come and, and, and work in this new dormitory. And it was really, um, it was really, I was very surprised because I, at Phoenix Indian School, they, these are freshman kids, they're boys that I was working with. When I started at Santa Rosa, well, I was working with little six-year-old boys and girls that were coming to stay in this dormitory. And so it was quite an eye-opener for me, a little sad sometimes, but, but I learned a lot. Uh, then I went off to school, uh, finished my degree at the University of Arizona, went back to Santa Rosa to work as a guidance counselor, uh, did that for a couple of years, and then went back to school to work on my master's program up at ASU. Uh, came home to work as the director of education for our nation, and I did that for seven years back in the 80s. Uh, left that job um, because of the politics. <laughs> and left and went uh, to work for a private college out of Prescott, Prescott College. And I worked in a very, or I helped coordinate a very successful teacher training program for Native American, uh, Native Americans who were wanting to get into the classroom as certified teachers. Did that for several years and then came home and um, Worked uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, I guess. We, did, we opened a family business. We, had a, we opened a little restaurant right there in the middle of, the, middle of nowhere. Uh, we were called Hashan Hashagit, 
which means amidst the sawara, or amongst the sawara, because in our village there's so it's a sawara stand. There's sawaras all over. And so immediately began to see visitors from Europe, from France, from Turkey, from all over Europe and the United States. And they were all on their way to Oregon Park National Monument <laughs> for some reason to look at cactus. <laughs> and he used to ask them, why do you all come all this way to look at cactus? But it was good for us because they, they would stop and, 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 and we would provide them food. So we did that as a family for several years. But the, I tell you, the restaurant business is very hard, especially, especially the way we were doing it. We were, we were cooking food in a very tradi traditional way using mesquite wood and making fresh tortillas and fresh fry bread and, and cooking everything fresh over the fire. And so it became very hard. And uh, my daughter, who will be 24 next month, was about five years old at that time. And on our way to, to, uh, to, the, to Casa Grande to buy supplies for the restaurant, all of a sudden she says, Daddy, I wish we'd never opened the restaurant. <laughs> and I said, why? She says, because we don't do the things that we used to do. Which is true. As a family, we were so tied to the business that, that we forgot family. And so it didn't take me long to realize that I needed to do something else. And so we got out of the restaurant business, and I went to work uh, uh, as a project administrator for a, a project with one of our mines, trying to uh, study mine processed materials and how to revegetate uh, disturbed lands. And then um, that job ended, and it was at that time when, when I received a call, and uh, people at, with the nation were very interested in bringing me on board to help coordinate uh, everything that was needed to, to design and build a cultural center and museum for the nation. And because I was very interested in, in cultural preservation, I was very interested in our history, uh, I accepted the job and, and began to work in 2001 for the nation and help coordinate uh, uh, site selection, help coordinate uh, uh, the selection of an architectural firm, a general contractor, and everything that we needed to do to get this museum built. And so once that job was finished, uh, my, my job was technically, I completed my job. Uh, at that time, we had a young man who was our curator of education who, who did an excellent job, but he wanted to move on. He, he went to work for the Amaranth Museum out at Dragoon. Which, which vacated that position, and they asked if I would stay and take over the curator, curator of education position. And so that's what I do today. I work for uh, uh, the, uh, the nation as a curator of education at Himdaki Huki Homo in Bihaf, which is the nation's cultural center and museum. But you're all invited to come out and visit at some point before you head back to your summer homes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay? So that's it in a nutshell. Okay? Just have to add that the very first place I saw Bernard was on the Today Show. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they came out and interviewed him at his restaurant. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of publicity. That was great. <laughs> so there's been some brief mentions of the San Pedro and the project where we first came together uh, with Bernard was this, the San Pedro Ethno History Project. But to go back a little bit prior to that, in the year 1990, the, we put together a volunteer survey to work on the San Pedro River Valley and spent four and a half years working on usually Saturdays or Sundays uh, every other month, every other week or so during the, the cooler months of the year, and covered the 75 miles from Benson on the south all the way up to Winkleman on the north. So Benson uh, is where I-10 crosses the San Pedro, and Winkleman is where the, the San Pedro uh, hits the Gila River at the north end of, of the river. So the river has its origins actually in Sonora and runs for about 150 miles total. But the archaeology out there, uh, what we were hoping to find, again, this is the idea of doing some, some big picture research, which is an important element of, of preservation archaeology. The, the key focus was to try and understand the transition between late 
uh, prehistoric times, what we refer to as the classic period, roughly uh, 1200 to 1450 or so. And the very different and dramatic uh, changes that took place between 1450 and when uh, Father Kino and the other uh, first uh, European uh, settlement came into the, what's now southern Arizona, when a uh, group that that uh, Kino would refer to as the Sabaipuri were, were living along the San Pedro and in the Tucson area, and trying to, to put together those two disparate times uh, was one of the initial main goals of that, that survey. Uh, so we covered those 75 miles uh, and found almost 450 archeological sites. It was incredibly productive. Everybody had a great time because we were always finding uh, new uh, things as we, we went out and covered that landscape. It's a gorgeous landscape to go out there week after week to see the seasons change out there. Um, it just was a, a transformative uh, experience, I think, for all of us who participated and for all the, the folks who were volunteers. We literally had on the order of 20 to 25 volunteers every one of those weekends. They would drive their own vehicles. I mean, this was a no funding uh, project. And uh, so after uh, finishing the survey, looking at what we had found, we didn't find all that much in, in terms of that early uh, historic, the Sabaipuri occupation, a little bit, but not nearly as much as we had hoped. Um, we found a lot in that classic period. And uh, that took us into a whole uh, other series of research looking at migration into the San Pedro Valley from up in the Four Corners area. And that's another topic for maybe one or two of these, these uh, cafes like this. So I won't, won't really go very far into that topic. But we did find uh, one new ball court. One of our volunteers, uh, Sherry Freeman, uh, was on the crew and, and found a, a new ball court uh, the other ball courts, there's about 10 or 11 sites with definite or probable ball courts on the San Pedro. The one behind me is at Reddington, and on your handout, um, there's on the side with the color pictures, there's two images, and if you want to take a look at those, Oftentimes, the question of a, on ball courts is, uh, well, first of all, what do they date to? Well, they seem to be constructed by about uh, between 750 and 800 AD. And they only last. Uh, they go out of use by about 1075 to 1100, at least down in the southern part of the southwest. And the question, well, was a ball game played in a ball court? And Emil Howry, uh, made a strong case that they're very much um, a, a place where a ball game was played. And some of the, this figurine, the scene of a, of a ball game is, I think, for me, one of the, the tools. This is from way down almost to, to Guadalajara in, in um, northwest Mexico. But the scene is showing a ball court and in the foreground, <laughs> there's a guy supporting himself on one arm and hitting a large ball with his hip. And what's, and the uh, observers are, are along the berms on the side. And what is pretty neat about this figurine is notice along the center line, there's three little bumps. So some, whoever was making this scene felt that those little bumps along the center line were very important. They're even painted a different color. And so in the majority of the excavated ball courts here in the, the uh, southern southwest, in the Hoacom area, um, along the center line of the court, there's usually three little markers like that. At the site of, of Snake Town, um, there was a, a cluster of, of sherds buried below the very center uh, of the court, and then, and then towards either end were two little stone markers, for example. And that court has a shape very much like this one out at, at Reddington. This, this is the deep depression. Um, 
this is a very, very impressive settlement. And it is, when you stand down in the, the bottom of that, the berms that are built up along the side are well over my head and I'm a little over 6'2". So it's a, it's a major earth construction. All of the big villages in these Hoakam settlements had uh, a ball court uh, in that sort of time period. So um, it's a very important piece of public architecture. And then the adjacent little illustration to try and make the case even further, a rubber ball was found, and this is a photograph of it up near Toltec, which I believe is, it's near Eli, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and this is actually produced at almost exactly the size of the original uh, object. So that 2.75 inches is, is almost exactly the size of this. So uh, there's a plant called Waiule that grows in the, in the um, Chihuahuan Desert. Its sap is very much equivalent to the uh, uh, Malaysian rubber plant, and that's almost certainly what made this rubber ball. It was chemically tested and came out as rubber. So the, the fact of um, artifacts like this, I mean, artifacts, I think, are out there to tell a story, and these two are really powerful in combination with the things that we found out on the ground. Uh, this setting out here is uh, very undisturbed. Uh, there's agricultural land down in the floodplain. Uh, this sits up over the floodplain. Uh, the, the ranchers that have been out here for literally uh, four to six generations uh, have maintained this site in very good condition. So uh, that was one of the areas that uh, we <clears throat> have not pursued as much in terms of our subsequent research, but I think sites like this have great potential to, to shed light on the, the nature of the, the Hoakam occupation and how it uh, relates to things down farther south in Mexico. But after we finished the uh, survey and uh, even went back and did some additional uh, testing at some of those later uh, sites, we realized that there was a need to look at what is the view of these places of modern native communities. And that's where on the back side of, of the handout is the study area for what was called either the uh, San Pedro Ethno History Project or uh, I gloss it by the title that we used in one of our Archaeology Southwest Magazine publications, One Valley, Many Histories. And that's where uh, Bernard uh, was part of the team that worked with T.J. Ferguson, now at the University of Arizona, and Chip Colwell Chanthapone, who is now up at the Denver Museum, uh, to address exactly those kinds of issues, what getting people out on the ground. And I'm going to turn it over to Bernard to share some of his experiences on that, that project and some of the other participants. So I was, at that time, the project administrator for this Cultural, Cultural Center Museum project. And one day I was asked to uh, come to a meeting where we were going to meet with uh, a, a number of, they didn't tell me what the meeting was about, but we, that we were going to meet with a group of archeologists that were, that were coming to meet with our Cultural Preservation Committee. And so um, I went to the meeting and uh, Roger Anion was there and Chip and TJ and who else was there, Roger, remember? <laughs> Anyway, it was, it was a few years ago. So, so we were there and they were discussing the Salt River project and the work that had gone on and the work they wanted to do and how they wanted to involve the, uh, the autumn uh, in, in trying to reconnect with that area. We, we knew uh, by previous studies that, that our ancestors lived along that river, but we've been away from there so long we, didn't, we really didn't have that connection. And so I was volunteered to help work with, with these archaeologists in, in pulling together uh, a team of uh, tribal members uh, to go along with them and try to, try to make that connection to that area. And so uh, with the help of Joe Joaquin, who is our cultural resource specialist, he gave me some names of some elders that I should speak to. And Jose was one of them, and his brother Joe. And we, we, we selected uh, 
Uh, we, we were really trying to pick some people from San Javier because they were closest to uh, the San Pedro Valley. In fact, they were probably ancestor or um, descendants of, of the Sobipari that came over to the, to the Santa Cruz uh, Valley. Uh, we, were, we were successful in identifying one elder gentleman that agreed to come along with us. And so with that, we, uh, we, we began to schedule uh, trips out to the San Pedro River Valley. And it was, it was a real eye-opener for us. Uh, we started up at, uh, up at Mammoth and started working our way down, and they were looking at platform mounds and, and discussing all of these things. So that, that discussion began with, with the elders and Chip and, and TJ. <coughs> Certainly had a lot of questions, and, and uh, the, the, the gentlemen uh, provided answers when they could. But they, in turn, also had questions of them because they were, they were learning as well as we were going through this process. Uh, I think one of the things that we first recognized uh, was an old roasting pit that we, 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 we came across and, and Jose and his brother began to share with the group the, the story of how they in their community uh, had similar roasting pits in their areas where they would go and collect agave and bring those down and roast them in these pits and so that discussion went on and we visited sites that, uh, that um, where, where the um, Pueblo, I guess the Hopi or the Zuni would live and uh, visit the, uh, the Kiva sites and everything. And so that was all very interesting. And we realized that there were, there were all these different groups that, that lived in that area at, at different points in time. But as we came further south, we came, we came to a community or a, an archaeological site called, I can never say this. <laughs> Gaibana Patea. Yes, that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we were, we were on this site, and, uh, and uh, Chip, was, Chip and TJ were, were, were pointing out these um, stones that were in a kind of a circular. And I guess if we weren't trained archaeologists, we're not trained archaeologists, so it, they had to point these things out to us before we recognized, yes, there was somebody that had built a, probably a, 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 a house made of stick and grass there at one point. But there was also a large roasting pit there that we could identify with. But Chip and TJ kept referring to these people as Sovipari, as a Sovipari. They were, this is an, a Sovipari village. And so we were standing on, the, on, on, a, on a, 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 a mound of dirt that at one time was a, a building, I guess, like a little fort or something. And, and Chip started telling us what he had read about that, that, that mound and how the stories they went with uh, how it was, uh, it was uh, uh, an adobe building at one time and how at one time the, the Apaches and other groups came to raid that area and, uh, and all the, the people in that community took refuge in that building mm -hmm. and how the Apaches had one rifle that they had taken from a previous raid and they were up on the roof shooting down at the people in that, in that enclosure and how they were saved by a group of warriors, autumn warriors, that just happened to be in the area. And they came, and they met up, and they, they, and they faced one another. And they made this decision to, to, for not everybody to fight, that they would select 10 of their best warriors from either side, and that those 10 warriors would fight. And then the winner, uh, whoever won, would win the battle. So, so, so a lot, there was a lot of discussion about, uh, about that area. But I think what really made a connection for us was when Jose, Jose, finally he couldn't contain himself and he came over to me and he asked me in autumn, who are these people that they're talking about? <laughs> he says, because what I see here is autumn. What I see here is autumn. And we said, yes, that's right. I said, remember how they called us Papagos? And well, they called us Pimas, they called us all these different names. They called these relatives of ours that lived here, they called them Sobipari. And so for a long time, we were trying to figure out what Sobipari meant, you know, because we know Papago means bean eaters, and we know Pima means Pinyamach, I don't know, you know. And so that we could identify with those, but we couldn't figure out what Sobipari meant or what they were trying to say until recently. Uh, in our discussions with, uh, with the documents from the, from the, Spanish, the Spanish journals, we, we, we read a lot about 
Father Kino's expeditions along that valley. And, uh, and in our discussions, we realized uh, Tony had mentioned that he had read on the Spicer's books that referred to those people, in those, those all of them that lived along that river as being the most warrior-like of all of the all of them. Uh, and they had to be because they were basically on the front line with the enemy that was coming in and raiding our lands. And so they were fighters. They were warrior-like. And so in our language, when somebody is warrior-like, you say, somebody is somebody and so, or with their, yeah, yeah, so, and so I think the Spanish heard that term and just like they just totally ruined Joe Tron, um, <laughs> they ruined all the world and called it so vipery. And so that's where that, so we think that's where that term came from. In fact, that's what we're going by now. <laughs> Fun fight, yeah. So these warrior-like people, we finally realized, and he says, oh, yeah, okay. So that connection was made. All of a sudden, this was our ancestral lands. It, 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 it meant so much more when, when we were there and saw that. And, um, and, and I guess this is kind of one of the reasons why I think I was asked to, to, to kind of take the lead on this project is, again, because of the, the, the goal of our museum and culture center is uh, history and uh, history and culture preservation and education, and so certainly this project helped us to understand our 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 connection to that land. And I was telling Bill the other day, you know, that our children today uh, now know that our land extended as far east as the San Pedro River Valley. That we had all of them living along that valley. It's no longer no longer limited to just the land that we have today, which many of our young people grew up thinking that this is, oh, this is only where we've been, where, we, where our ancestral lands go much further than where we are today. So. Okay. I want to jump back a, a little bit to the, one of the key elements of preservation archaeology, which is actual protection of archaeological sites. And again, it was a, a situation of loss that stimulated our response back in 1993 when if you've been in Tucson a long time, you'll know that in both 1983 and 1993, there were 100 year floods. So statistics are like that. You can, <laughs> and in the 1993 uh, flood on the San Pedro River, a site just down uh, toward the river from San Manuel is where the mine tailings and, and so on are, are, are located. Uh, that mine had built all sorts of, of uh, wells and water pipes and that sort of thing adjacent to the, the floodplain. And the flood waters were threatening that infrastructure that they'd invested in. And literally in the course of probably just 12 hours or so, they took heavy equipment out there and put one of these entire uh, platform mound villages into the river to protect their investment in the uh, infrastructure. And what ultimately shocked us about it was that we didn't find out about that for about six months after it happened. So back in 1993, we didn't have uh, direct uh, daily contact with people out on the San Pedro River. It was a real wake up call that we needed to start interacting with the community, not just drive out there on the weekend and drive back to Tucson and you know, be researchers, but to get much more actively engaged in what's going out there on that living, working landscape. So we started talking to people at the Nature Conservancy. We started talking to people in the Natural Resource Conservation Districts. Those are really the land use, rural land use communities out there on that landscape. So we started to do outreach. Uh, eventually we were able to actually put a half-time person in the community of Cascabel out on, on the San Pedro. So we became 
uh, landowners actually and are members of the Natural Resource Conservation District now. So we've got a much stronger working relationship with folks up and down that valley. We know individual ranchers and we've developed a uh, conservation easement on one of these uh, late uh, classic period sites and 50 acres of, of um, property. We own about 95 acres in another parcel and the really exciting thing was last Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, the title closed on this ball court is now owned by Archaeology Southwest. <laughs> and again it was the relationship that that Jackie Dale, who's been out, living out in uh, Cascabel, now lives in Bisbee, but she had worked closely with the Ronquillo family out here, and every time she would say goodbye to them, it was like, well, if you ever want to sell that ball court, um, <laughs> talk to us. Um, and finally the time came when it was ripe and, and it worked out. So we were hoping to continue and, and uh, actually be able to purchase more of the site, but the ball court and the central plaza are now you know, a permanent protected state. So uh, that importance of uh, a, an active site protection program, uh, it was our partnership with the National Trust for Historic Preservation that allowed us to hire Andy Lorenzi in a full-time basis as well. So we're, we're slowly putting together the pieces of, to cover all of these uh, components of, of preservation archeology. span And I thought, um, maybe just having Bernard either, do you want to give a little bit more um, of the way the, the cultural community, uh, excuse me, the cultural center pulls to some of the, hearing Bernard, if you get a tour of the, <laughs> the heme.key from Bernard, you see the passion that he put into making this place happen <laughs> and uh, I mean, I hope that you can get out there and, and uh, see that place, but maybe just a little bit more of the way the elders use the place and um, how it fits in, is, is growing into the, the community. Um, well, again, the, uh, the, our elders were, were very concerned that our young people were not learning uh, our, our traditional values and ways that our young people were, were, were forgetting some of these things. And so it was, there was a lot of discussion years back about, about establishing a place that would help, again, to preserve and educate our young people about their history and their culture. They had to know where they, where they came from and what they were about. And so um, um, money was appropriated uh, back uh, in 2000 through uh, through gaming revenue, so thank you, those of you that go to our casinos, <laughs> keep going, <laughs> because we took gaming revenues, and we took $15 million of gaming revenues to, to design and build and, and furnish and initially operate this cultural center museum. And so, at first, with the way I look at it, there's a reason for everything. And when we started, it took us almost three years to agree on a site. So we went around talking about this museum, talking about the cultural center, talking about the importance. And I think it took that time to help us realize that this was much more than just a building. That it was very important to our young people, it was very important, I think, to the future of us as all of them to, to really understand who we were, that these, these things would be housed in that building. Those programs would be housed in that building. Those programs would, come, would go out from that building in our, in our outreach programs to our community, and that our elders were invited to come. We have a special room we call our elders room. You're all welcome, those of you that uh, are not in denial. And can, come, <laughs> <laughs> can come to our elders room. We, we, we hold our elders in very high esteem because of the wisdom that they hold. And so we dedicated a room to them. And uh, we have various activities. And so 
the whole idea is to is to have a place that that's ours, that be, that that was, was belongs to us, and that we we um, decide what we want to teach in that in that facility. And uh, I think projects like this really helped us to to really um, understand uh, some of our traditional lands. And as I mentioned earlier, I think we, we, we teach that to our children. We have an exhibit in our exhibit hall that has the history of our land. And it, and it, and it mentions the San Pedro River Valley and all the way up to the Gila River, to the Colorado, all the way down into Mexico, and how that was our traditional land. So our kids are, are, are learning this because of the center and because of work that we did with the Center for Desert Archaeology, or the Ooh. Southwest <laughs> <laughs> Archaeology Southwest. <laughs> so, okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, again, just to close, we'll open this to questions in a, in a second here, but that point that preservation archaeology is an evolving mm -hmm. ethic, and I think the interaction with uh, communities like uh, the Tana Autumn Nation, uh, we've got a new National Science Foundation grant that should be awarded very soon. We have another partnership where we'll be collaborating on research with uh, the group of elders that uh, Dale Brenneman has been uh, consulting with out there. This process of seeing the work that we do be relevant to the landowners out on the San Pedro, to the archaeological community, to a broad general public, and to uh, the Native American communities is really what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And again, the process will continue to evolve and develop. So if there are any questions, we'll be happy to. And you remember, you need the microphone to. OK. Um, those of you with questions, raise your hand. If you don't feel like asking your question out loud, there are pads of paper and pins on the, on the ta tables. Feel free to just let me a note, and I will. I brought my reading glasses tonight so I can read your question out loud. Um, and before I open the floor to questions, Bill, if you could just really quickly explain what a conservation or preservation easement is and how that works, that might help. Okay. Yeah, a conservation easement, it's a uh, basically a property right or property ownership has a bunch of different um, elements to it. And you can actually just sell or donate your, uh, say, your development rights. If you the conservation easements that we hold uh, don't allow subdivision of the property and they don't allow uh, damage or disturbance of the ground surface. So people are giving up those rights. And sometimes, you know, you can reserve an area for a residential, a future residential site, that sort of thing. So we are taking those rights and, and either buying or, or receiving them. And then it's our responsibility to monitor that those uh, that there isn't land disturbance, that there isn't uh, something that would cause damage to the archaeological site. So that process is uh, what we're doing with the preservation or conservation easement. Very well. I think the first question was here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bill, you mentioned that there were a number of volunteers involved in a particular site. Could you elaborate on what specifically the volunteers did or what they typically do? The, that's a, I'd be happy to. Um, we have on, on that archaeological survey, we were able to use something over 120 to 150 different people over those four and a half years. And on an individual Saturday or Sunday, I think we had as many as, as 25 to 30 people max. And what we would do is, is use at least one uh, trained professional archaeologist with that crew. And people would get uh, training in, in this is what we're looking for out there on the ground. And literally, we would just walk back and forth across the ground surface. And people would call out, well, I see something that looks like a pottery shirt. Or, or, and then you would stop and examine that uh, and discover a new archaeological site. So that, um, this new project that we're um, being awarded from the National Science Foundation may have opportunities for volunteer work. And that's probably going to happen. Uh, wouldn't happen before the fall. So on a lot of our projects or a lot of the work that we do, we, we don't do a lot of excavation. We don't do, uh, we use the very lowest impact uh, strategies when we, we uh, approach the archaeological record. But we will be doing some work that, that is, again, going to be able to use volunteers probably in the fall. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. 
the question was, uh, what, what are the volunteer opportunities on that particular survey, and what did the volunteers do? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. I'd like to know, in what sense is, uh, I want to clarify the definition of preservation archaeology. Earlier in your talk, you mentioned that uh, there were some uh, roads going through, uh, I guess, uh, part of the Jaki or San Javier. Uh, and you did archaeological research and found certain things there. Would you consider that kind of thing where there is going to be a project that will destroy things and you're documenting and finding out what is there to be preservation archaeology? And um, secondly, uh, you did mention that you were going to do low impact excavation. In some sense, excavation always is destructive. And so how do you, what constitutes the degree of destruction, maintenance that still is within the bounds of preservation archaeology? Those are very good questions and I'll try to give you some good answers back. Um, first of all, the, uh, let me clarify the historical um, context. When we started back 30 years ago, we were actually the Arizona Division of the Institute for American Research. And in those initial, from 82 to 89, uh, 1982 to 1989, um, we funded a lot of the work that we did through uh, actually sort of doing contract archaeology. And so that I would not necessarily define as pure uh, preservation archaeology. There's a lot of things that, that folks in that, in that contract funded world can do uh, to achieve more preservation or a balance between preservation and uh, uh, excavation and, and uh, development of, of a site. So there's, there are even things in that world that, that you can do that can improve the amount of site protection that, that ultimately happens. And so that was the context in which that early work um, happened. The, I mean, on two things have to be looked at. One is that pretty much any archaeological site over the very long term is going to degrade and be, um, you know, have much less information uh, than it has today. So we're, we're dealing with a resource that's, that's eroding or uh, decaying or being uh, somehow modified just by natural and geologic processes as well as, as uh, development pressure. So that's one concern and we really view uh, you can map and find a great deal of information about just examining what's on the surface of sites that haven't been plowed. You can uh, collect artifacts or information from the surface and gather a great deal of of information from uh, that kind of study. Those are pretty much no impact uh, approaches. But oftentimes to get <laughs> that next level of information, you need to con conduct a, at least a small scale excavation. And uh, we use one meter by two meter or three foot by six foot uh, test units usually put into uh, trash mounds or trash uh, deposits in order to get information about what's the time range of the occupation, what were people eating, uh, some very basic information like that that you simply can't get off the surface. So um, there's no absolute that, you know, if you put more than three units into a site, you've moved out of preservation archaeology. But always looking at what's the least amount that we can excavate to accomplish uh, what we're interested in from a research perspective. So that's how we, it's a balancing act in every, in every case. And what, what other threats might there be to, to a site? So those are the kinds of things that we try to consider actively when we're uh, taking on a, a project. Next question. Um, my question is um, about the ownership on the land. You had uh, just gotten applause on a, a part, 
one of the parcels that you were excavating is now owned by the Archaeological Society, is that correct? Which site are we referring to? The Reddington. The Reddington the Beaucourt? This entire site probably encompasses on the order of 40 to 60 acres. Um, so we've made uh, some of it state trust land and wouldn't even be um, avail available for purchase. Two of the major pieces right in the center of the site are owned as private uh, property by two different landowners. Mm -hmm. And we've negotiated with one and own then this large site and, and the seven or large feature, the ball court and, and about seven acres that surround it. And when we conducted our limited excavations back in the um, early 2000 uh, and through 2001, we worked mostly on, on a, well actually it was a good mix of, there was state trust land, there was BLM land, and then there were some private um, properties that we worked on, again with permission of the landowners. That's one thing in the San Pedro Valley, you want to make sure that you have the permission of uh, landowners when you go out on that landscape. They're a little particular about that. <laughs> okay. So my question then is actually, um, as much as it's good that it, it is in protective hands, why is it not in the reservation hands? Why did the reservation not buy that land? Because it is their heritage, their ancestry, their, you know, so that there was something more put back into the, the reservation hands who really have, a, you know, well, I really think infinite more knowledge uh, th through the tribal uh, ways of protecting the land than we do as, well, uh, really white people. Sorry about that, but I'm just wondering what, you know, was there any opportunity for the reservation to buy that land? So back in the, back in the uh, early 70s, uh, we were, we were, the early 70s, I think, was the end, of the end of a long court case where the nation or the tribe was suing the federal government for all of the land that was taken from our ancestors. All the land along the San Pedro, from the San Pedro River up north through toward Colorado, all the land that surrounds us. So <clears throat> after 20 years in the courts, we were visited by people from Washington at a public meeting where they basically said, uh, we're going to pay you for all of this land that we took from you. You're not going to get the land back, but we're going to pay you. Uh, but we're going to pay you and what the land was worth back in those days, back several years. So I remember very, I, I was a young man <laughs> then, and I remember going to that meeting. And I remember our elders coming and speaking. They had to have microphones set in the middle of the auditorium. And every one of those elders came up and spoke in the language and said, we don't want your money. We want our land. We don't want your money. We can't, we don't, we don't have, we have no use for your money. But that land that you took, is the land of our ancestors. Their spirits are there. Yeah, and we want, to, we want that land back. But we, the federal government basically said, it's take it or leave it. If you don't take the money, then you lose out completely. And so I think a lot of people voted under protest, but agreed to, to that settlement. And so we were paid 26 27 million dollars uh, for all of the land that was that was taken. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, yeah. okay. Next question. Um, some people here are probably familiar with the Archaeological Conservancy, and I just wonder if you could talk about some similarities and differences in, in site protection strategies between <coughs> Archaeology Southwest and the Archaeological Conservancy. The Archaeological Conservancy versus Archaeology Southwest is the question. Um, and we are, we actually do a, a number of partnership um, enterprises with the Archaeological Conservancy. They're based in Albuquerque. 
Uh, they actually have a nationwide uh, practice where they're pursuing uh, actual outright ownership of archaeological sites. And they will purchase them, they will put together a uh, management plan and basically put um, site stewards out monitoring the, the condition of, of the site. And we've actually um, talked to them initially about, well, we really think that at Archaeology Southwest that a conservation easement is a lot more uh, cost effective way to get protection on many archaeological sites. Oftentimes they can be donated and uh, we don't have to invest any uh, upfront money in uh, gaining a conservation easement. Their, they had some really bad experiences in a couple of their early uh, site easement uh, experiences and they basically said we're not going to do that again. That's, um, they, the person that you negotiate that first conservation easement is always a really friendly uh, or tends to be a very friendly and very likely to comply. Well, when the next generation or the third generation of landowner comes along, they weren't there at the start and they may not have those same kinds of uh, you know, warm fuzzy feelings about the archeological uh, easement that's on their property and may want to either violate it or give you all kinds of hassle. So that is, a, you know, we are using a, an easement strategy in an area where we feel like we can maintain ongoing good working relationships with landowners. It's, it's a place where we're doing our active research program. We're willing to and able to get out there on an annual basis, which is a, actually a legal requirement to do at least an annual inspection of is your easement uh, being violated or is it, is it um, being complied with. So we are, wouldn't take an easement that was in East Texas, for example. We don't work in East, East Texas. Um, we're Archaeology Southwest. And so anyway, those, that's a, a, there are different strategies, but I think a lot of the same goals for long-term site protection and uh, the Archaeological Conservancy doesn't do active research itself. That's another difference. How does the mining rights and their water uh, acquisition rights affect what you're doing on the San Pedro? All right. Um, the, I mean, just in terms of where we've worked, the main interaction with the mines has been with the, 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 the mine there at um, San Manuel. And Again, they're interested in that location. We're interested in the subsurface mining. And the water rights, um, once they gave those, you know, the, once they gave up having an active mine there, the water table has been rising. Uh, there's been, you know, positive environmental outcomes on, on, on that front. But they were actually very willing to give us access to the land to do the surveys. They had not really disturbed the area all the way down by uh, and immediately overlooking uh, the San Pedro with the exception of the one site that they took out overnight. So um, that's really our, our main direct interaction. We worked with Asarco farther north and they've been willing to give us access to their land. They, they own a lot of property out there because they want to control the water rights, but the surface um, is less of a, a concern and they've allowed these minimal uh, access for survey and, and limited excavation. As, as I recall, you said um, Archaeology Southwest explores and protects places that matter. Could you talk a little bit about your vision after you've explored and protected of, sh of sharing the, uh, the knowledge that you've gained that way and your strategies of sharing that? Thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, one of the key, 
and our site protection program has, is in the process of identifying an array of archaeological sites out on the landscape. Um, we like to tie them into a larger research initiative. We're about to uh, talk at a conference in a week and a half about our Salado Site Protection Initiative, which is going to look at sites up in the Four Corners area where the Cayenta population left in the 1280s or so, moved down to the uh, Safford and, and Globe areas, later uh, turned into a, a new cultural phenomenon that is, we're saying is, is a, a viable way to describe the Salado uh, culture. So we will be looking at sites all through that area and trying to, to protect places that fit that research theme. That's one of the things that we've got in place. Um, in terms of Archaeology Southwest Magazine is probably our primary, it's our flagship way to communicate with the uh, broader public and to the professional community and to students. A lot of those issues of Archaeology Southwest get used in college classes where they're teaching Southwest archaeology all across the country. Um, the next initiative that we're uh, undertaking, uh, Doug Gann, is, uh, has been since the 1980s sometime, working with digital models of archaeological sites, giving people I mean, so many of the archaeological sites, um, even on the San Pedro, because they're on private property or because they're just difficult of access. Um, very few people in this room will probably ever get to a lot of those places. But uh, Doug can take a, an archaeological site plan and his incredible toolkit that he's been building of software and, and uh, details of, of architecture and textures and put those together, modeling artifacts, put those together into places that you can now actually uh, walk through, explore. And so that is what we're calling virtual Southwest. Um, so that's one of the things that's in the oven. You can actually see the sort of the first uh, example of virtual Southwest on the Archaeology Southwest website now. So we're always, as I said, our, Preservation archaeology is a, an evolutionary process. We're always looking for new ways to reach out and share and uh, the uh, kinds of, of um, things that we can't do at all either, That's, which is why partnering with <coughs> the cultural center out at uh, the Ton Autumn Nation is another mechanism for getting this information out. So uh, lots of ideas and a lot of them are actually happening. In here? Yeah. Um, this is sort of addressed to Bernard, but I, I wanted to uh, ask a little bit more about uh, an earlier question concerning the tribes or the, the nation's possible acquisition of, of, of a site like this. Because when you gave us that wonderful tour out at the Cultural Center, I believe you told us about the acquisition of. Uh, an area west near near Huai, yes. about a square mile out there, yes. which had actually been purchased by the nation, and I believe incorporated into the nation, well, even though they're, it's they're, they're, the the plan is to to have that incorporated as part as part of the reservation, or as part of the nation. But I just that question was asked the other day uh, of uh, people that work with the uh, Yatirata, uh, those people out in that area. And they were told uh, that everything was put on hold until we get the Glendale issue cleared away. And so once that's cleared, then there's always that possibility of, of land acquisition. But we were talking earlier about uh, patent lands within our boundaries and how, the, how th those lands were owned by non-tribal members because they, they had those lands prior to the reservation system going in, it's being set in place. And so we have, through the years, have purchased those uh, those lands, uh, and so there's always that that possibility. You know. So something like acquisition of mm -hmm. important or uh, properties of this sort could could be contemplated, in the, perhaps. 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 Yeah. I think 
we have time for one more question? Okay. To speak right into the mic. Yeah, I have another question for you about something I heard on NPR about a, a year or two ago. It astounded me was that they were talking about an archaeological research project. Maybe, maybe it wasn't on NPR, but it was about an archaeological research project in um, perhaps Turkey or uh, Greece where the chief archaeologist, it was completely non-destructive. They used some means to ascertain what was below the surface, and they were able to do that. And I'm wondering what that was, and if anything like that is at all applicable to some of the things that you're doing. So that's another good question. I mean, techniques that don't require you to actually pierce the ground, disturb what's under uh, underground, are they're, in many cases, they're very effective. Um, they give you uh, a, a different kind of information than you get from excavation. And in the very last issue of the, it should be coming out next week, the final issue of the old format of Archaeology Southwest magazine, um, the topic is imaging the Southwest. And one particular technique that's used in there is, is ground penetrating radar. And it's, it's able to go across the ground surface. Down here in the southern southwest, it will sometimes get kind of a vague signature of a, of a uh, pit house. Uh, it will get a, it can pick up the, the signature of an irrigation canal. Um, it's like you're looking, though, through glasses that you've sort of put Vaseline over the, your, your lenses. And it's, it's not the crystal clear picture that you get from excavation. So, that doesn't, you don't always need to excavate to get basic information. If you wanted to know, well, approximately how many houses might be in this um, archaeological site, you could probably get reasonable estimates using that, that technique. And in the northern areas, um, actually, it's sometimes even much more. I've seen maps of, of uh, buried pit houses that are very clear using. Uh, uh, magnetometers and resistivity, there's, there's another set of, of tools that can be used for, for that. So it's a technique that um, for research purposes, I think it's particularly um, very useful uh, for people who are going to be working in front of a uh, construction project. I think there you just need to go at it with um, tools that are going to give you a clear answer uh, right away. So it's, it's, again, using the right tools to, to do the right, um, either get the right research results or get the right um, um, respond to the, the threats to that, that resource. So uh, I wish there were even better, and I think there will be in the future, technology. So it's, we look forward to that. <laughs>